Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Senior Director of Programs at Jewish Funders Network, and I'm happy to welcome you to today's program on participatory grant making in action. This program is part of a joint project of JFN and Upstart called Granted that we launched just about a year ago to help strengthen the relationships between grant makers and grant seekers. In addition to organizing monthly programs such as this one and facilitated conversations, Granted offers a wide range of tools, articles, case studies, and other resources on its website, jgranted.org. And I encourage all of you to visit that website after this program. As I said before, today we have time together to explore participatory grant making in action. Participatory grant making or PGM is an approach to bridging the gap between grant makers and those that they serve, the grant seekers and the people in the community that, that are helped by the grant by including and empowering the people affected by funding decisions to participate in the decision making. And today we will hear from um, a few of our panelists who will be introduced in just a moment that went through um, participatory grant making and will share about their experience and, and how they got there. We will also learn some key takeaways for grant makers and grant seekers who are interested in exploring this new model. Today's program will be moderated by Dre Atkins, the Vice President of Jewish Community Im Impact at Third Plateau. And now I would like to hand it over to Jure to introduce our panelists and to, and to get us started today. Thank you so much, Jure. Thanks, Tamar. Uh, it's really lovely to be here today and to continue the conversation about participatory grant making with the Jewish communal field. This is our second time exploring together with the granted webinar, um, and it's a delight to be asked back to be a part of this. As Tamara mentioned, my name is Jure Akshan. I'm Vice President for Jewish Community Impact at Third Plateau, a social impact strategy firm. Our team had the pleasure of working alongside JFN to research and write a guide on PGM to support dialogue in the Jewish community about the practice. Today's Granted is an extension of that work, and we'll have the opportunity to learn alongside the team from Reflect Sensi at the Jewish Foundation of Cincinnati about their experience running a participatory grant making practice. Before we get started, let's just do a quick overview of what actually is PGM. Participatory grant making, I'll share my screen really quickly, is a process that shifts grant making decisions to the communities most impacted by the decisions. It allows for those closest to the problems being solved to have authority and agency over how funds might be distributed or used. It does not mean that a grant maker needs to give up all of their power um, in decision making, nor does it mean that they need to hold all of the decision-making power. It's really more about giving voice to those who are impacted by grants or donations. We created as part of our research, a spectrum to help understand what PGM might look like in various communities. We see PGM as a spectrum where different foundations or donors have different reasons for sitting at different points along the spectrum. There's no value, greater value in any particular point. It is truly about the needs of the community and the needs of the funder. As you can see on this chart, there's a few potential points from consulting community members about decisions to including community members on boards to fully seating grant making power. I also just wanna note really quickly that participatory methodology and practices are not restricted to grant making. We know, and I'm sure many of you know from your own experiences that participatory methods can be used for program design and for evaluation. I think we'll hear a little bit about that later today. So as Tamar mentioned, we have the pleasure of hearing from three folks from um, the Jewish Foundation of Cincinnati who have worked on a project called Reflect, Sense, Reflect Cincy. I'll ask all three of our panelists to come on screen uh, so that I can introduce you and we can start our discussion. Thank y'all. So with us today, we have Kim Neustadt, who's the Director of Research and Learning at the Jewish Foundation of Cincinnati and the Project Lead for Reflect Cincy. We have Aliza Lubin, the Managing Director of Program Operations at Upstart, who supported Reflect Cincy's design process. And we have Aaron Schild, who is a professor at Miami University and a participant in Reflect Cincy, and will share his experience as part of this process. Um, as we have our participants introduce themselves more fully, feel free to add your questions in the Q&A section. We'll be monitoring that for the discussion that will come after introductions. So to kick us off, Kim, I'd love to hear and you share a little bit about what Reflexency actually is and how you decided on the participatory grant model in the first place. 
Thanks, Jeray. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> I'm Kim from the Jewish Foundation of Cincinnati. Um, our PGM process actually resulted from a data-informed strategic planning process um, that the, the foundation led, um, in which we identified underrepresented segments in the community um, that we understood required a different philanthropic model to address. And we recognized that we could not do this work Work alone. So just a little bit about the foundation. We were established in 1995 um, with assets from our Jewish hospital. Um, and today we have assets um, over 500 million um, and we distribute roughly 18 to 20 million dollars to Jewish Cincinnati to strengthen um, our community in the areas of education and engagement um, and human services each year. The Reflexency came about because in 2019, uh, Brandeis University conducted our um, community study. Um, and from that, um, we understood that nearly half of Jewish adults uh, felt disconnected from Jewish life. Um, among that, there were three um, identified um, underrepresented segments, and those were uh, young adults, interfaith families with children and families with young kids. Um, and through follow-up research, you know, we understood that these folks felt separated from the community in certain ways. Um, there were barriers to connection, uh, but ultimately they sought togetherness and connection and community. Um, so with a mandate to serve you know, the broader community, uh, the foundation really took this data to heart. Um, and we, the why was that we understood that you know, every Jewish Cincinnatian should be able to see themselves reflected in the community in some way. And we knew we needed to take immediate action. So our trustees um, approved a working proposal for what we're now calling Reflexency, which is a pool of R&D innovation funding designed to spark connection and meaning for these underrepresented segments. And this was meant to be a complement to our support of existing institutions uh, with a real area of focus in our strategic areas. Uh, so this really wasn't a question of why this was important, but how we were going to do it. And that's really where the PGM model came about. Um, we knew from the start um, that for this work to be successful, the people we were trying to engage would need to be at the table. Um, and we recognized there was a gap between our leadership and those who we seek to serve. Um, interestingly, we actually didn't know about the term of uh, participatory grant making, um, but we're super excited when we connected with Jure and, and read the guide um, on participatory grant making to understand that there's precedence for this work dating back to early Jewish community and you know, indigenous cultures um, for much earlier than that. And you know, that we are really amongst a long line of people who've been uh, practicing this for a long time. So in our case, Reflexency you know, really flips the philanthropic model that we've been leading at Foundation uh, to give influence to those most affected, allowing voices to be heard without money attached and to um, create opportunities for new ideas. Uh, we wanted to build a team of 10 people uh, with a mix of lived experiences and connection to their Jewishness. And that also include people who we thought of as bridge builders, those who might be strongly connected to Jewish community, but had lots of broad networks and a real openness to test their assumptions. Um, and one of those incredible team members is with us today on this call, Aaron Shield, who you will hear from in a couple of minutes. Um, but for most of these individuals, Reflexency was their first grant making experience. Um, in the Jewish community. Um, and for several of them, it was um, their first compelling experience with a Jewish institution in recent years. Um, and and their, their tasks were to identify, really look at the research in our community, identify and define uh, the problems we're trying to solve, um, to uh, shape the request for proposals, 
and review those proposals and make recommendations to our trustees for approval. Um, by Jewish standards, the group's relatively diverse. Um, a few are Orthodox, um, one is a rabbi. Uh, we have folks who are, are in interfaith households or um, houses with folks of color. Um, some are LGBTQ, some have children, some don't. Um, some are very strongly connected Jewish, to Jewish community. Others live out their Jewishness through their advocacy. But everyone came to the table um, wanting to um, help those who feel excluded in some way from Jewish community to help fi them find community and to help the foundation experiment with a more representative model for philanthropy. So after an extensive review of proposals, uh, this team uh, made recommendations to our trustees uh, for an official vote, and those guarantees will be announced um, in the next couple of weeks. Um, so it's very exciting, um, and you know, just a, taking a big step back at sort of thinking about the goals for Reflexency, you know, our long-term goal was to create an open, reflective, inclusive, and diverse communal culture uh, in which anyone can find a pathway to meaning and connection. And what that means in the short term is, um, you know, for those we hope to be served, uh, to feel that they're developing um, uh, a sense of belonging and connection um, to Jewishness in whatever way that looks. And for our grantees to be testing and learning and bringing stakeholders into their process um, so that they're adapting to the needs of the time. Um, and you know, a very important part of this process was how um, the grants were designed, the criteria, um, how we were really envisioning our goals. Um, and our partner in this, Aliza Lupin and Upstart, is going to talk about this in a couple of minutes to really share some of the intention behind this work. Um, and just for some background, Aliza has been a real thought partner to me since the early stages of this project um, and will continue to be um, a support to our grantees on the back end who in addition to funding will receive um, coaching and testing and learning. So with that, I'm gonna pass it to Elisa. Great, thank you, Kim, so much. Uh, first of all, thank you everyone for being here. It's a pleasure to be here and to get to talk about this particular work, which is Kim, as Kim named, has really been years in the making, in particular in some of the conversations that, that she and I and, and the rest of the, the Jewish Foundation have been having. And so it, it's really important to note that when designing this whole process, as Kim said, they went back to look at this communal survey data and the deeper understanding of what was behind the numbers in order to figure out, well, as Reflect Cincy's committee was, was assessing, how do we provide this support? They landed on effectively research and development grants or research and design grants as, as some people are looking at them. And that's not a fluke. It, there's no there's there's no sort of like, oh, I wonder how we landed there. What the data was showing and the entire premise behind having the Reflexency Committee was that the current programming was leaving people feeling as though they weren't represented. They didn't have a voice in the reality. And so it wasn't just let's get the committee together, but what should the actual grants be for? They should be for making sure that programming and supports for the community are still involving all of those voices. And so there's a real focus in thinking about the design of the grants themselves and putting that emphasis on making sure that research components, that testing components are forefront, because those are some critical spaces where the voices of the community become incredibly important. How can we start to shift the way the entire community sees developing new programming and supports to say, like Jure's image at the beginning, those voices get involved so much earlier in planning, in feedback, in decision making. And so it was really interesting to note that in order to really have a grant that is focused on that premise of doing the research involving the, the voices, testing and iterating, the foundation and Reflect Cincy had to step back and say, well, then our, our end result, our desired deliverables from all of these grantees, 
need to look different than the typical. And that actually sort of threw the prospective grantees for a loop at first. They're not used to a prospective funder saying to them, no, no, our, our desired deliverable at the end is not how many people you can get in the program. That's not what we're looking for. And everyone had to reorient their thinking around this design that was so thoughtfully done by, by Kim and the Reflect Cincy team to say, if we really want them to feel that they can involve people and start to have those voices be part of the decision making, then we can't say to them, design in a vacuum and go and run the program and we want to know how many people come. Instead, our deliverables have to be about the learning process of starting to listen to the community, hearing the needs, an initial design based off of that, getting feedback on it, what did you learn? And to say to a prospective grantee that at the end of your grant, your deliverable might be a discussion on why your design was completely wrong. And that's okay. Not only is it okay, that would be amazing. That was mind boggling to some of the prospective grantees. When, when was the last time that a funder said, not only is that okay, we're looking for that. We're looking for that as the end result and the deliverable. And so, you know, I'll name that that, that represented both an opportunity and a challenge. Um, something that, that, the co that the committee really wanted to bake in was this notion of real visibility so that people could understand the true nature of, of what those deliverables should be and what the purpose of this grant should be. And Kim and the committee were very thoughtful about setting up community-based touch points so that prospective grantees could learn about what those end goals should be and could learn about the purpose of the grant so that they could meet with each other because collaboration was not only a good thing, it was act actively welcomed. They set up spaces for everyone to be able to connect and share ideas, not in a competitive way, but again, in a collaboration-based manner. They set up interviews, one-on-one -on -one feedback sessions with myself and Kim to say, based off of your initial idea, here's some reminders on what does it mean to be elevating voices and really putting the research into your process. Um, and at the end of all of this, again, this notion of really centering equity, centering diversity, building bridges between the gaps that exist, you know, the people who their expectation is to come in and say, okay, I read the data, I'm going to design a solution and to stop and say, let's break that down. How do you shift your entire next year of work so that you're taking that gap and you're, you're narrowing it? You're getting closer and closer and closer. You're bringing more people into the process so that you aren't making assumptions, taking guesses, but rather you're building something off of the reality and the lived experiences of the people who are uh, attempting to, were attempting to serve. So uh, all of it was uh, a real eye-opening moment for the, for the grantees and the prospective grantees and with real excitement, but also it, it took a few months for a lot of them to get there. Thanks, Elisa. Erin, would you share a little bit about your experience as part of Reflect Cincy? Sure, yes, I'm happy to be here as well. Um, so my name is Erin Shield. I was a member of Reflect Cincy. Um, I, I guess I wanna give you a little bit of background uh, just on where I'm coming from and then how I got involved um, in the experience. I'm sort of, uh, consider myself to have a strong cultural Jewish identity, but a secular non-religious one. Um, I'm gay, married to a black man. So in a interfaith, interracial gay relationship, we value, I guess I've always thought of our values as explicitly sort of multicultural. Our community is, you know, we don't focus on my particular ethnic identity or or his in particular, but uh, really value diversity. And um, although we had incorporated some of um, some Jewish traditions into our family life, like uh, observing Shabbos or having seder's that were explicitly sort of Jewish and African American, um, basically never do anything. I was Jewish and, and I'm not from Cincinnati either. So we came here seven years ago and, and never got involved with the Jewish community here. Um, so how did I get involved in Reflect Cincy uh, is through a friend of mine who I had met in the neighborhood who was involved, who was uh, you know strongly involved in the Jewish community. 
Um, and she knew that I was not involved. And so perhaps that I, you know, could offer a fresh perspective. And although I'm not really one of the three segments that we were targeting, I am, you know, sort of an example of a disconnected Jew in Cincinnati in an interfaith relationship, no kids, but, you know, and not quite as young as, uh, unfortunately, as the, <laughs> we had set the limit at the definition of young at 35. So, um, but in any case, she asked me to, if I'd be interested in joining, and I said, no. Um, I said, no, I'm not really that interested, and thank you. And she ignored me and gave my number to Kim. And so I was irritated by that, but I thought, well, maybe I shouldn't have this reflexive no. Maybe I should give it a try, at least find out what it's about. Um, and talked to Kim about it and thought, wow, this is a really interesting opportunity and, you know, why not? Um, my grandmother's advice to my mother had been, always been say yes before you say no. And I, her words reverberated in my head. So um, in terms of, so that's how I got involved. I said no, but then I said yes. In terms of what the experience was like, um, in a word for me, it, it was actually transformational. Um, in terms of my attitude towards Judaism, my sort of understanding of myself and, and my identity. And in that sense, I think maybe, uh, you know, I'm an example of kind of how this process can work both for the people who are on the participatory grant making team and then potentially also for grantees. And, you know, specifically, it helped me to, to examine what some of my biases were, some of maybe the um, implicit passed on generational traumas around Judaism that I didn't quite understand, um, fears about homophobia in the Jewish community, um, and things like that. So it was really through the relationship building that we did on the team, the specific people who are on the team and the ways that we built relationships with each other that enabled us to, to work together and to, and to potentially do something transformational in the community. Um, so the opportunities there were, were incredible. I mean, to create something truly new. Um, and I think we really benefited again from the diversity on the team Although it depends how you de define diversity, you know, I mean, it's, uh, I think, you know, I'm happy that as someone who is not religious and not affiliated um, and with a little bit more of a non-traditional background that, that my voice was included. Some of the challenges or tensions um, of working within that framework, I mean, I guess, you know, it did seem like a momentous, almost impossible task from the beginning to create something out of nothing. We were given a lot of structure which was great, um, but we also really were breaking everything down to the foundations. Um, and that was really exciting, but it was also incredibly difficult. And I think if you took the same group of people and had us do it all over again, we might come up with completely different criteria, completely different ideas. If you had different people on the team, I think it would have been totally different. Um, so that's kind of exciting, but it's also, it's just it's kind of strange. Um, and, you know, some of the other challenges or tensions, I mean, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that while we can value diversity, that we also have to acknowledge and be clear about the fact that there are some unresolvable tensions within the Jewish community that we're not going to overcome through putting a team together where everybody kind of likes each other and works well together. You know, so I, I think it's important to be upfront about that and to say, look, we we hold different values, we hold different ideas about what being a Jewish person means, and we're not going to all agree about those things. But we do need to agree about what what our values are, what is our mission, and how to how can we um, you know best serve that mission and work together with mutual respect. Um, so I think. That, that's a little bit about you know what what my experience was like. I I am really glad that um, my friend gave my number to Kim despite my you know protests. Uh, I now it's not like I'm now super involved, but I have gotten more involved with the Jewish community after this um, experience. I was asked to co-chair a an event um, 
that was part of the Jewish Bicentennial here in Cincinnati, as well as part of Pride Month, a Rainbow Shabbat event. And I said yes to that. And so I guess I am leaning a little bit more into it. And in that sense, the mission of Reflexency, which was to reach the 50% of Jews in Cincinnati who were disconnected and not involved, at least worked with me as part of the team. And so I think that that experience, you know, probably bodes well, I'm guessing, uh, for some of the grants and grantees to have the potential to do the same for, for them and for other people in the community. Thanks, Erin. Um, that's great. I want to pull out just a, a handful of nuggets that I heard in, in our panelists' um, words of wisdom here. So um, first, we have a funder who has acknowledged and is willing to acknowledge the gap between their own experience, their staff's experience with that of the community, and a willingness to go out and understand that in a more meaningful way. There's significant use of data to get at kind of the core here of like what is really needed in our community and what might we design around that. There's the invitation to organizations to learn and to fail and to try again. Ooh, we don't get that very often. That's awesome. There's the idea of this process as potentially transformational for those who take part in it, whether they are engaged in the community or not. Um, and that it's hard. Let's just acknowledge that it's also hard. There is a time commitment here. There is a lengthy process. There is, there's potentially group tension. There is potentially a lack of understanding. But in the end, we think the product outweighs that tension and those challenges and that it's worth trying and moving forward with. So I'll remind the audience that you're welcome to throw questions in the Q&A and we'll be moderating and adding them to our panel discussion as we go. Um, but to kick us off, um, one thing, you know, you touched on this a bit, Erin, when you talked about um, that you're now getting more involved and that this process has been transformational for you and has connected you to a different ways to the Jewish community. But I'm curious about other unintended outcomes, either personal or professional, um, for you yourselves or your organizations um, and, and what this process has done. So um, Kim, if you could actually kick us off on that, on, on any unintended outcomes that came out of this process. Yeah, I mean, I think Erin so beautifully spoke to this, but, you know, going into this, you know, I'm sort of thinking the outcome is everything that happens you know, post team, like once we start getting the grants in. And what we realized is like what we were building, the process of building reflexivity and the team was the outcome. Um, and, you know, seeing, you know, our team evolve and change, no matter where they were on the spectrum of, you know, their connectedness to Judaism, you know, testing their assumptions, being vulnerable, um, sharing, you know, their experiences and really, you um, listening, I think, um, created really strong connections. And, um, you know, one of the things that we did early on um, in the process was build a lot of time in our timeline for building team. And I remember talking to our lead facilitator and thinking like, do we really need to spend all this time? Like, let's just get right into the work. And I am so glad that she pushed back against me and said, no, we, we really need to take, you know, the co first couple of months to really um, uh, build relationship and trust. Um, and that paid off in the end because people were willing to be vulnerable and really share things that they may not have had spaces to share that before. And I think that's what kind of helped people shift you know, have those shifts in perspective. Um, and Aaron was, you know, one of many folks, I mean, everybody, but that was so courageous in, and I think that's really the word and kind of sharing, you know, parts of themselves that they might not have before. Um, and the group was really intentionally, um, you know, diverse in the way that people kind of define their um, Jewishness. Um, and that could be uncomfortable for folks that, you know, might not be as connected to Jewish life. And, you know, when I just think back to these conversations, I just feel so much grace um, for those in the room who were able to really um, bring that perspective and, and be open and vulnerable. That's great. Thank you. Aliza, any, any shifts for you personally or professionally? Yeah, um, I think a few things, you know, Kim, Kim started by talking about the data. Aaron really summed it up really nicely. 50% of the, of the community that wants to be engaged, but, but isn't, or doesn't feel that it's, um, uh, that it's, it's a fit for them. And 
when we went into this, the, the focus group data had highlighted these three target segments. And then you have Aaron so aptly putting it. And like, technically, I'm not even one of them. And there are so many ways where I feel like I am disconnected, but, but you know, like could benefit from. And, and that was something that came up uh, more than once throughout the process where people were saying, I was really so excited about this because the focus is on diversifying the opportunities within the community and centering equity as a part of the process. And yet I still don't feel represented or I still don't see myself in this. And it's, there's a reality, you know, one of the things that, that Upstart really sort of puts at, at our priorities when you are growing an idea or an organization is you can't prioritize everything at once. If you try to prioritize everything at once, everything will lose out. And so the notion that there might be many things that are important, many segments of this population who are critical and who deserve and need that support. And what does it mean to have to make some hard choices about, well, then who goes first, who goes second, who goes third? And it was a moment, you know, Kim and I at one point had, had a, a conversation after one of these community meetings of saying, but there are realities and this is a reality and where many people may feel I still don't see myself, how can we position this as and what is coming next, right? What is the opportunity behind it? Um, so so that's, it's, it's a reality that, that it's not everyone immediately, but what are the steps along the way? Yeah, thank you. That's great. Erin, um, I know you, you shared a little bit about some of those unintended outcomes for yourself, but I'm curious if there are others or if you've seen shifts in the community that you weren't expecting already through this process. Yeah, I, I don't know about shifts in the community because I didn't know anything about the community. <laughs> Fair <before>. enough. <laughs> um, I wasn't expecting to, for it to be so much fun um, or to, to, have, to gain so many friends from it. I mean, I really do consider a bunch of people from, from the experience to be my friends and I'm excited about the kind of community that we can continue to form. So that was completely unexpected. Um, you know, and then I certainly wasn't expecting for this to lead to some sort of deep dive on my own like family's, you know, um, trauma around Judaism, but it definitely made me think about what happened, you know, along the way that led to um, not just a sort of well, you know, on the one hand, a strong cultural Judaism, right? And I was bar mitzvah and like went to Hebrew school and stuff like that. So like they did believe in like cultural traditions, but they were also strongly anti-religious. Um, and there was just a, you know, I think it, I, I traced it back to my grandmother who was the youngest of four, who had three older brothers who were all Orthodox and she was the rebel and I'm come from her, you know, her and she was rebelling against that strict Orthodox upbringing. So I was not expecting to kind of go for this to be a personally meaningful journey, um, I guess. And it, and it has shifted me certainly personally. I don't know about, you know, professionally, um, cause I'm not, in, you know, that's not my gig in terms of what I do professionally. Um, but going forward, I definitely think my, my attitude around, um, Judaism and, and my orientation to it has really, has really shifted unexpectedly. Yeah, it's lovely. I think it's um, a really great lesson for all of us, that participatory process, whether we're talking about program design or we're talking about grant making or we're talking about evaluation has the potential to have really tremendous impact, whether it's about building trust, Kim, as you said, or whether it's around personal journey or whether it's around a greater product, right? Like it, it hits on all of those levels. It's, it's really lovely. Um, one of the criticisms which we have brought up a bit here is that PGM is really time consuming. You have to go out and find the folks who should sit around the table. You have to engage them. You have to teach them what grant making is. You have to facilitate that process. You have to define a lot of things like your mission, your vision, your values, the criteria by which you um, do grants. I'm curious if we can speak to that time commitment and both the benefits and the challenges there. So we heard one benefit, it builds incredible trust. I'm curious if we can speak to any other benefits and challenges as part of this time commitment. Aliza, do you want to kick us off this time? Yeah, happy to. Um, I, I think, you know, from there's so uh, much sort of um, assumption, as I was naming before, on how grants typically work and what's beautiful about participatory grant making and even just the increased desire to visibility into the grant and grant making and grant receiving process is it's attempting to 
in the same way participatory grant making is creating greater inclusion, that's the functional way to do it through the actual grant making process. And I, I remember in conversations with Kim talking about, okay, before you can put anything out, we need to like articulate the criteria. We need to share the rubric against which the grants will be, will be evaluated. We need to share a notion towards what will your ultimate evaluation be and all of these conversations that lifted up the importance of that. So many of us in this community, you know, for the various organizations we've worked for or the various grants we've applied for, how many times have we gotten to the end of a grant to now be given the evaluation questions and realized, I really should have set up my entire grant evaluation from day one completely differently in order to be appropriately able to answer these questions and, and then worry about getting dinged and not getting a renewal because we weren't answering properly. Like that's a lack of visibility. It's a lack of understanding that, that as a grant maker, it is you are creating by not providing all of that. So yes, it takes more time on the front end, but the, the benefit is greater impact. The benefit is stronger data to tell the stories. The benefit is potential grantees feeling like they can show up and not be afraid that something's going to be, the rug is going to be pulled out from under them or a new surprise is going to show up at some point. And the reality of our community is when we when we say we're just going to sort of like do the normal process or rush this, it's actually not an inclusive process. There are so many parts along the way where people don't feel that they can tap in, they don't have the resource to tap in, they don't have the institutional understanding to tap in. And so then as, as a grant maker, when we do that, we're just leaving all of those potentially wonderful ideas for the community at the wayside. Kim or Aaron, thoughts on the time commitment? Yeah, I was just um, to piggyback on what Aliza said. I think I was, you know, I had the benefit of going through Upstart's Change Accelerator and seeing how they were modeling like what um, an accessible and equitable um, grant process should look like. Um, and so, you know, it took time to do that on the front end, but I think for us, it was like, how do we carry the participatory intention, like that through line throughout? Um, the process was really important. So it did take time, but I think it was very important to our work. Um, what I would say as kind of a challenge to the timing part is that, um, especially for those who are doing this work uh, within an established institution like we were, um, you're always going to have to be navigating change within your existing stakeholders. And so there was, of course, a desire for this work, but also an understanding that there was sort of an impatience, like we wanna see it happen. We wanna see what the grantees are, you know? And so um, there was an adaptive leadership and design um, part of this that we had to take into account. It was a real balance of let's build enough time and let's also recognize that we have to be responsive to our stakeholders as we're building this. Um, and so I think for those who are interested in building something and sort of thinking about what's the right timeline and, and building the right scope or scale of your project that's bite-sized enough that allows you to have some wiggle room in that timing, but also stays you know, on a schedule that feels right to the stakeholders in your organization. Yeah, that adaptive piece is incredibly important. Our community is constantly changing. So that's, I'm glad you highlighted that and noted that. Um, Aaron, any other thoughts? Yeah, just from, uh, from my perspective as a participant, um, you know, Kim was very upfront about the time commitment. And so as long as that's clearly communicated and, and you and you commit to that, then it's fine. I didn't find it to be, you know, overwhelming. I think we probably met on average about an, an hour a month or something. Is that right? Mm -hmm. yeah, something like that over the course of a year and a half. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, one thing that I could tell was that on, on Kim's end or on the back end, that a ton of time had gone into it because our time was always well used. And I, and I can only imagine you know, how, how much thought and effort went into that. Um, so you know, I, <laughs> it, it seems to me that it, it must be incredibly time consuming, um, but for the participants to have well-structured 
you know, good use of time to never feel that we're, that our time is being wasted. That's incredibly important because of course, if, if we had sensed that, I think we would have disengaged from the process. That's great. I, I think that's such an important reminder about the, the, the experience of the participants um, and ensuring that the design takes, it's not just about getting to an end goal and getting to the grant making and what that looks like, but is really as, as much, if not more about the participant experience, which is certainly how Reflexency was set up. That's wonderful. Thank you. We have a great question from in the chat here. Um, he's what he's noting is that the model of PGM seems like it could work really well at a community foundation such as the Jewish Foundation of Cincinnati um, or at a federation, but it might be harder to overlay some of these ideas on smaller private or family foundations. Kim, as the as the grant maker on the panel, I'm curious if you have some initial thoughts on that. Sure. So um, our foundation is actually not a community foundation in oh, the sense God. that um, we don't even take donations. So we operate as a private foundation. Um, so it's at a bigger scale probably than a smaller private or family foundation. But um, in some ways that was an asset to this process because um, the folks who are invited to the team were not like sort of your typical donor class. I'm not sure how, how much or if any of them give to Jewish organizations at all, um, let alone have done kind of grant making um, at that scale. And so, um, and that was actually like a real asset to this because um, we didn't want it to be sort of um, a sort of a typical model where it's sort of your, it's a benefit as being a donor you know, to be in a process like this, what we were prioritizing were the lived experiences of the people on the team and having that and using that to drive um, how folks were shaping and defining the problems that we sought to address. Um, I think where it could come into, um, uh, you know, maybe a sort of a caution or not a caution, but just sort of a limitation maybe for a smaller foundation is just more capacity and time. Do you, does your staff, if it's maybe only one person or two people, have the time to do something like this? And I think that's where you have to think about, okay, are there bits or nuggets of PGM that we don't have to like bite off all at once, but that we could do, whether it's, you know, being intentional about who's on your committee, you know, making a few spots available to something that's you know, much more thorough and comprehensive. And I think um, there are different ways that one can build in elements of PGM. Um, for us, we kind of did a lot all at once. I don't know if I would recommend all of that. Um, so like, for instance, you could really focus entirely on building a team and having the application process be much more simplified. Like maybe it's not an open process. Maybe it's by invitation only. Or perhaps it's like an incubator, like the team itself incubates one idea. Um, and so you're really prioritizing the team building and the defining of the problem, less the external facing community grant process. Or you could say, no, it's more important what the process is. We're not going to focus as much on the team. So I think there are different ways you can approach it that just feel right sized to your organization. That's great. And I'll also just um, note and through here for everyone to look at that this is the link to the participatory grant making guide um, on JFN's website. And in there, there is a couple of examples of small private foundations who have done some level of PGM that might include inviting people to their board as advisors, maybe non-voting members, but advisors who have ex expertise in the community that they can share their both lived experience, but also their knowledge of the community uh, it, to help with grant making decisions, as well as in one case, there's an example of a small family foundation who has a living donor who has decided that they are not the best representative of what they're trying to accomplish in terms of goals and making decisions and has ceded full power of decision making to the community. Um, and so some of those examples are in there to read further. Thanks for your question. Great. As we begin to wrap up, um, I, have, I have two more questions. The first is, um, what piece of advice might you have for folks interested in exploring PGM, whether it is for program design or grant making or evaluation? Let's start with Erin. You have a piece of advice as a participant to those working on this process for others. What piece of advice might you have? Uh, you might need to go beyond your networks. Um, you might need to ask friends to ask their friends or, and maybe go out even further than that. Um, I, you know, I think that our team, our team is great. Maybe for the first time, I would love to see a, you know, a team in the future be even more, um, let's say, 
uh, less reflective of our current institutions, perhaps. Um, although we had a nice mix, I would say. Um, and don't be afraid to fail. Big risk, big reward. I think that you have to kind of, um, you have to be a little bit adventurous um, with this type of grant making mechanism. Great advice. Eliza? Uh, I think it's really important to be okay with the things that surprise you. Be okay with the things that feel in conflict with how you've done things in the past. Um, being able to be comfortable to say, I don't even know what I don't know. I have been in my own lived experience or in a exposure to people with similar lived experiences. And that means I have what to learn. And that's going to inform what this looks like. Uh, it's that uh, openness and the awareness of what might be that is really going to be a lever for some positive uh, opportunities through this process. Okay, Kim. Yeah, I would say kind of in a similar vein, um, having led this process, I think there was, I had to go through a sort of process of um, releasing a little bit of control, <laughs> you know, and there's a lot of stakeholders that were involved in this, you know, our trustees, our staff, broader community. Um, of course, we wanted this to be successful. And along the way, um, it was a growing experience for me of sort of saying like, where do I insert myself? Where do I step back in the background? Let the team really lead. Um, and so there was always a sort of balancing act. And I think um, for anyone who's choosing to lead something like this, um, you know, it's a growth opportunity and sort of thinking about how, what your role is in something like this. That's really great. Yeah, I'm really struck. There's There's been a lot of really fascinating comments that the three of you have shared with us and ideas. I'm really struck by the idea that the same team, the same group of people coming around the table might have different, totally different ideas the next time. And the openness and willingness to say that's that's okay. That's that's okay. Let's like explore this together because our community is changing, the data is changing, the way we want to engage is changing. And that openness and that growth edge, as you just mentioned, Kim, is really important. Um, I I don't have a, a, a great final question other than to say, is there anything else that y'all would like to share with the group before I wrap us up? words of wisdom, great moments of the process that you wanna highlight? I guess I, I would just, you know, issue a, a reminder that Judaism means different things to different people. And, and although there may be fundamental resonances across many or all of us that, um, that, that a lot of us, you know, have conflicts and, ambivalence and whatnot that that could be uh we, we come with different different baggage i guess is what i'm saying and, and um and however that i guess my lesson is um that it remains a, a rich source of of meaning um and and community and so um i guess just to remember that it's not a, it's not a monolith which i'm sure you all know so but it's uh it's worth remembering thank you Kim or Lisa? Yeah, I mean, I just think that PGM or anything participatory is a real opportunity for us to remember that as we think about, you know, what are the challenges that we're facing in our world and the Jewish community, like who's sitting around the table matters. Um, and that even in bits and pieces, this kind of approach you know, can help us ensure the relevance of Judaism and Jewish life as it continues to evolve. Um, so it's very exciting to be a part of it and um, for others to contribute. Great. Um, the, the piece I want to add, I, I want to first of all give real credit to Kim and the folks at the Jewish Foundation for as she said before, like they really took soup to nuts of the entire process, which is a lot to take on. And I want to lift up one of the really lovely pieces that I um, that I see is the recognition that when you are going through a, a process and you're asking your grantees to do things so differently, there's a component of support and training that they may need, and that the foundation is in the is in the space to be fortunate enough to provide. 
And even what that training looks like has an opportunity to hear directly from them. Kim and I had a great moment a few weeks ago where we were talking about the plans for what training would look like. And then we all of a sudden said, well, maybe we should ask the prospective grantees about the time commitment of this. And she came back to me and said, yeah, none of them have capacity for that time commitment. So let's, let's look at it differently. So even within your grantee pool, once you're looking at them, there are these opportunities to lift up those voices in the design of letting them talk about what support they might need. So there's an element of it may feel like it's never ending, but it actually is all in service of something incredibly beneficial. Yeah, Aliza, I'm glad you said that because it just may, it goes back to you know the beginning, which is that Reflect Sensing was always meant to be an experiment for us, like our own R&D project. Um, and with that comes like a real interest in a learning process from start to finish. And so even though, you know, part one might be complete, we have so much to learn about what has been done to date and what's coming up the pike. And um, we really hope to take that learning, what the experience was like for an applicant, for a creative team member, for the grantees as they're doing their project so that we're constantly evolving and making sure we don't get stuck in whatever model we started with because we want to make sure that um, we're, we're evolving and meeting the needs. Thank you. Uh, this was incredibly interesting. Um, I hope it was informative for our audience. I am in, grateful for your time uh, and your willingness to be open about what worked, what was hard, what was great about this process, both for you personally, in particular, Erin, um, but also um, professionally for Aliza and for Kim. So thank you so much. I hope that our audience is giving you a big round of applause from behind their screens. Um, I also just wanna name um, that we hope this conversation sparks ideas and interest in participatory methods that you can wrestle with both the challenges and the benefits of this as you go about your lives. And I also wanna give a, a big thank you to the Crown Family Philanthropies who helped fund um, the report itself um, and allowed Third Plateau to do this research alongside Jewish Funders Network. And with that, I will turn the floor over to Tamara to wrap us out. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you so much, Jare and Kim and Aaron and Eliza. I really appreciate, just like Jare said, the openness and the time to sh that, that you're taking today to share. And um, and I hope uh, also, just like Jory, just to reiterate what Jory said, that this is just a start of more conversations of different ways that we can um, fund in the community and learn with each other and from each other about the best ways to continue to make impact. Um, so thank you all for participating and thank you again to all of the speakers and um, Jory for, for moderating today. And hope to learn with you all again soon. Have a great day.